Welcome to Palmyra Grace Church's Sermon of the Week. At Palmyra Grace Church, our purpose is to help people pursue a life with God together on mission. To that end, our hope is that each Sunday message influences your Monday and every day of the week. For more information about Palmyra Grace Church, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Or find us at palmyragrace.org. Now here's this week's Sermon of the Week. Good morning. Will you turn your Bibles to Matthew 5.43, please? 5.43 through Matthew 5.48. If you're not familiar with our Bible, will you please turn to the internet and just type in Matthew 5.48, or 5.43-48, and it'll pop up. I learned how to drive a car when I was 18 years old. And 55 now, so that's 37 years. And I was taught how to start a car. And it was simple. You took this key. See, there's a key. You sat down with the key in the truck. You had to have the key. You push your foot on the brake. You put the key in the switch that's in the stern, steering column, right? And you turn it. And since I had a Ford truck, it started 100% of the time. If you have a Chevy, it's your fault. And I can do that without trying. I can remember it. I did it for 37 years of my life. It is part of my life, who I am. And after I started the car, I would reach for that lever on the steering column pull it and put it in park, and I can go everywhere. And it worked perfectly. So someone changed it. Some engineer. I'm convinced it was a female engineer. For a good reason. Because you can have this and put, and put it in your purse, and you don't have to hunt for this for two hours, right? My wife got another Ford. And she's got, what's this called, a keypad? I don't even know what it is. All I know is the first time I got in her car to start it, she gave me this. And I tried to pop this thing like that. And it, there's no button on it. And she starts laughing. She's going to torture me for the first time. And I'm like, Sharon, how do you start this car? He said, Dave, you don't need a key. Push in the brake, real easy, and hit that button. So I look for the button on the steering column, and there's no button on there. It's over the side somewhere. At least they could put the button in the steering column for us old people. And I actually could start the car. I pushed on the brake and had this with me, and I pushed the button, and the, st and the car started. It's a Ford. I grabbed the steering wheel. You know that column there? I pulled down on it and the windshield wipers turn on. Because they got a button to put it in drive and park and reverse. I am going to kill myself someday because I'm going to go put it in park and it's going to be moving forward and I'm going to forget to put it in park there. For 37 years of my life, I started a car without confusion. Now I'm confused. And you laugh. If you haven't gone through it, you will go through it. And when you young guys learn how to drive, you will have a keypad. But when you get 55, they'll take that away too. So it's coming. Be patient. Can you imagine with me, for just a few minutes, if you had a teaching a spiritual teaching that's part of your life. That you were raised your whole life on this spiritual teaching. It makes you connect to the world. It is how you live. Your whole life you're taught that way. Your parents taught you. Your pastors taught you. Your rabbis taught you. Your small group leaders, your mentors. I mean... Everyone, even your grandparents taught you this teaching. 
Then one day, this guy named Jesus, he's 30 years old to 33 years old. He shows up, he sits on top of a hill, and he says that your teaching's wrong. You don't start a car that way. You got to have this to start a car. You don't live spiritually this way. You live this way spiritually. He looked at his disciples and said, love your neighbor and love your enemies. But your teaching was love your neighbor and hate your enemies. Would you be frustrated? I mean, your mom and dad taught you wrong. Your pastors taught you wrong. And here's this Jesus saying, you start a car this way, you love this way. Would you be a tad bit frustrated? Like I am. Every time I go to start my wife's car, I forget how to start it. Because I am used to this. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, I want you to get used to starting a car this way. Because that's how you do life. Would you be angry enough to crucify this Jesus and put him on the cross and say, you're wrong, Jesus. You're from Satan. You need to be crucified. Or would you be inspired to look at this new teaching and say, wow, that could change my life. That could change the direction of my life. That could change my marriage. That could change my enemy who hates me. Matter of fact, that could change the world I live in and take this Roman nation and convert it to Christianity. Could it do that? This love. Instead of hate. Would you not want to know what that teaching is at a young age, as a teenager, or as an age, as a grandparent, and figure out the heart of this teaching? Because it's so simple. That anyone in this room can do it no matter how old you are or how young you are. And this teaching comes from one verse in the scripture in which Jesus used. Be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Can you imagine living that way? And he's looking at everyone in that crowd and he says, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I like to make this simple because I taught teenagers my whole life. So teenagers, this is for you. I spent 20 hours doing this for you this week. This is the term that you need to come up with. Live a fresh life of love and not hate. Being a Christian is living a fresh, powerful life of love and not hate. If you don't believe me, go to school and see the difference. You can tell a true Christian because they got a power of love and not hate. It's our world in need of a fresh love of life and not hate. Are we living in a world full of hate and angry where thousands of people each year are, are murdered because of anger? And do we have a fresh love to change that? Yes, we do. And this principle comes from Matthew 5.43. In the context of Matthew 5.43 and 5.48, most of us know this. If you were raised in the church, you know this. We just need to be reminded that our love needs to be freshened up every once in a while. Anyone that's been married more than 28 years, I'm not there yet. Your marriage has to be freshened up, right? What about when you get to be 60? Do you still have to be freshened up? Anyone there yet? I can't wait. Another 30 years of marriage? Cool. My wife is so sweet. Verse 43, let's look at the context here. You have heard that it said. What was said? Here's what was said. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. For 37 years, they were taught to love this way. To love their neighbor and hate their enemy. That's how they started spiritual life. Every day they started life this way. We loved our neighbors, but if you were our enemy, we did not love you. We hated you. 
They were taught that way. Could you imagine? It happens. And Jesus is just repeating what he, what he, what he heard. But he's just repeating the teaching of the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, it was very simple. It was like, love your neighbor. In Leviticus 19.18, this is the best thing about this text. Jesus is not teaching a new teaching. He's just reminding everyone there that the Old Testament teaches this, this teaching. It's that simple. In Leviticus 19.18, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one, among, uh, one another among you. But do what? Love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So the Old Testament can be summarized in one verse. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so can the New Testament be summarized in one verse. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's that simple. That's how you live in Christianity. It's a relationship of love. But somehow, somewhere in the faith of Judaism, they added to this verse. Now, does anyone in Christianity ever add anything to a verse? Never, right? You'd be amazed. And these were professional teachers, Pharisees, scribes. Um, they copied the Bible. They had all these verses. But if you to do a search in the Old Testament for hate your neighbor, you know what you're going to find? Nothing. How did it get into the teaching of the Jewish faith? Well, it comes from a wild interpretation of Deuteronomy 30, chapter 30, verse 7. And here's what it says. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your who? Your enemies. Did God curse enemies in the Old Testament? Yes. Is God going to curse enemies in the New Testament at end time? Yes, it's of the love of, of God, the justice of God. There is a teaching in the scripture that God is just and evil will be punished. And who does God curse? Enemies who hate and persecute you. But does that mean God hates them? I don't believe he hates his enemies. And the reason why is because who did he send to love them? Jesus. But some, somehow in the scriptures, the, the Jewish faith put hate in there. And it's not true. Some engineer redesigned this. So a sweet, kind wife, my wife loves this, because all she does keeps in a purse. She never looks for it anymore. But I only know how to love this way. Could you imagine sitting in this circle doing this? But the best thing about Jesus, he doesn't stop. He continues. He owns this then. But I tell you. What does Jesus tell him? He's sitting there. He's teaching his heart out. He's just sharing the whole fifth chapter of Matthew. We've just gone through it. He ends it with a statement saying, But I tell you, love your enemies. Start the car with this thing. What is this called? A what? I can't, a phone? I can't, I can't do it. I went out and bought a new truck right after my wife did. I got one with a key in it. Because I'm unwilling to change. <laughs> How many of us are not willing to change to love a neighbor that hates us? It's tough. It's easy to preach this. It's tough to live it. But a it's not a keypad? Font? <laughs> that is weird. I'm really getting old. What happens when I get 80? This is scary. But I tell you, do what? Love your enemies. Who are your enemies in this context? It's the Egyptians, right? It's the Romans. Why are the, why are the Egyptians enemies of the Israelites? Because of what the Egyptians did to them. Thousands of years ago, they enslaved them. And Jewish people do not like Egyptians because of their history. They hate. There's a hatred there. There's been wars there for how many thousands of years? But God says what? Love them. What about the Romans? The Romans took over their land. 
The Romans possessed the land. Could you imagine our land being taken over by a foreign country and God tells us, you love them? I would want to shoot them, would you not? That's why I have guns. That's why there's over 400 million guns in America. Because if someone comes into our land, what happens? But God says here, love those Romans. But God, they put us on the cross. If we don't obey them, they crucify us. This is not fair. Why do I have to love them? It's so much easier carting this, starting the car the old way, is it not? To me, because I can remember how to do it, but that button's pretty easy too. What about those teachers and those, those tax collectors and that government and stealing our money? The tax collectors were evil in this time. They just took thousands of dollars. But Jesus has a guts. He is so bold to fall because he looks right at them. But I tell you, you love your enemies. You have this interpretation wrong. You do not hate you love. But God, that's impossible. You're right. But not through the first beatitude. But he doesn't leave it there. Check out this little word that he's, he starts with, and. And when there's a word and, there's another command, right? And pray for those who persecute you. Have you ever had to pray for someone that hated you before? God, can you just wipe them out, please? God, you're a God of wrath. Just wipe them out. You can change this in one minute. That's been prayed more than once in my life. But that's what Jesus does not mean that here. He wants you not only to love them, he wants you to pray for them to persecute you. So that verse 45, that you may be what? Children of God, your Father in heaven. So that you might experience the power of being a child of God in heaven. That's kind of like the first beatitude. That there's a relationship with Jesus Christ that's so powerful that you would experience what it means to be a child of God in heaven. You would have the same power of Jesus Christ. The same love. And Jesus loved the enemy so much that he died for them. Isn't that amazing? And Jesus is not done. I love what he does here. He just gives us simple illustrations. And most of us know this by heart. It's one good thing about this message. You already know all the text. We just got to kind of live it out some. He does that in the rest of verse 45. Now he causes his son, S-U-N, our God in heaven, made this big, beautiful sun that we see almost every morning. And it's going to get really hot this week. So when you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, teenagers, you will see something you've never seen before. The sun rise. Okay? It's really beautiful. And it doesn't start, it starts now about 5 o'clock. And it's like neat. And it's so calm. It's so quiet. The presence of God is there. Try it, teenagers. Wake up at 5 o'clock. Just do it once a week. And just... It's beautiful. And God causes us that. And he does it to us righteous people. And he does it to evil people too. He calls the sun to rise on evil and good. Why? Because that is the love of Jesus Christ. Does he not love the world? Does he not love the people of the world? That God gave his son. And that love causes this issue to rise every day so we can see his glory. No matter what you have done in your life, no matter where you are in this world, in the evil that you, are, you partake in, I want you to know that the sun rises every day for you to see the greatness of God. Every day. Not just here, through the whole world. That's how mighty God is. And all he wants us to do is to love the enemy. Which one's easier? Man. 
And he also does something else. Sun is light. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God does that? You bet. Rain here is food. Take rain away and what do we eat? Sand? Fish? In the ocean? Ugh, I hate fish. Oops, I used the word hate. I'm sorry. No matter what you have done, God allows it to rain in front of you so you might eat. And He loves you no matter where you are and what's happened in your life. Throughout the whole world, righteous and unrighteous people, because He sent His Son for you, no matter where you are. Because God is a God of love, not hate. And even when He judges the sin of this world, it's still going to be out of love. Verse 46, he makes it even a little bit more personal. If you love those who love you, okay, I have found out as a Christian, it's easy to love Christians. Unless it's Pastor Dan on a golf course. He hits it 300 yards, I hit it 150. It's depressing. No, seriously, I find it easy to love pastors. They're kind people, they're not perfect. They're Pittsburgh fans. He's going on vacation this week, so i got to get it in. I'm not going to see him for a week. But seriously, it's easy to love people here, is it not? Yeah, we have our little conflicts, but that's nothing compared to hate in the world. And that's what Jesus is saying here. If you love someone like Pastor Dan, what reward would you get? Nothing. It doesn't help you any. It might help him, but there's not a reward there. The reward is in loving your enemy. That takes guts to say. That's almost impossible. Well, it's not if God works in your life. If you love those who love you, what word would you get? Nothing. And are not even the tax collectors doing that? People who, tax, who collect our taxes... They love each other with our money, don't they? And that's what's going on here. They hang out together. They have a wealthy living here. They make good money for not doing anything but collecting money. Must be nice. But if your love's not more than that type of love, you're missing something. And I want to do the next step of life until I found it. Because it radically changes you in the world you live in. Verse 47. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? I mean, the world can greet people, say hi and bye. I can walk up to any person and say hi and bye. That's easy. So, but do pagans do that too? But do you know what tax collectors do and pagans do? They hate their enemies. They cancel them, do they not? We use the word hatred today as the word cancel. I don't know who came up with the word cancel, but it's been going on for years. Just be a Yankees fan in the Philadelphia area. What happens? I mean, these guys cancel me out all the time. This guy puts a Boston Red Sox hat on from Pittsburgh when I go golfing. And we're 0-5 against them this year. He just loves me. But seriously, with all that's going on, it's easy to love people that you hang around with. It's a little bit harder to love someone who's a little bit different to you and might hurt you and pick on you. And Jesus ends this with what I consider one of the boldest teachings in the Scriptures. Because this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where you've got to learn to start a car with this. And if you've been doing it 37 years with this, you know what I mean. It's not easy. But I think I can change enough to start my wife's car. I think she got the car on purpose, so I wouldn't drive it. Because she knows I leave dents. And that's not a joke. That's true. 
Jesus quotes a very simple scripture in the word. It comes from Deuteronomy 18.13. Isn't it amazing that Jesus uses both scriptures to teach? It's nothing new here. It was in the Jewish culture forever, from the day the scriptures were written. And it was a very simple scripture. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What does that mean? Perfect means complete, mature. If you've been a Christian more than five years, you have enough information in your heart to love someone that hates you. That's what it means to be perfect. And you know, if you've been a Christian more than five years, you have enough information. Not only, you know it takes the power of God to love that person. And that's what this verse means. It's that simple. And you know you've got to come to a point in your life, if that person hates me, you've got to come to a point and say, I'm not going to hate that person. I'm going to love that person and say, but God, you're going to have to give me that love. That's what this verse means. That's all it is. Done. We can go home early. What time I get done today? 12? I'm going to make it. First time ever. That's all that verse means. But I'm going to share a story of how hard this is. I lived in Middletown. Anyone here from Middletown area? Um, for four years, 2000 to 2004, my wife and I did a ministry there in the town, and we didn't have enough money to buy the big house yet, but we had money to build an addition. So I took off the top of the house and put a new, bigger house on top of the small house underneath it. Because I love building houses. It's my hobby. It was a beautiful house, and it sold in one day when we moved. That's how neat it was. And one day, I was out there building, putting siding on and roofing. I forget exactly what. And my child, who was six back then, is now 26, was playing in the backyard. Now, for you who have video games, you don't know what that is. <laughs> but for we who weren't raised on video games, that's called having fun with your imagination. You know what they're playing? Not backyard baseball. You know what backyard baseball was? A wiffle ball and a tennis ball and a broom. That's backyard baseball, not a video game. Literally, they were playing cops and robbers. And for you who are teenagers, let me explain what that is. There was three of them, and they were behind me, one to the right of me, and my son. And they had guns, play guns. We used to give them to our kids and let them play with them because we have a right to have play guns in America. Okay, so let's do it. And they had two guns, and the cop had one, and the robber had one. The robber would shoot the innocent person, and the two cops would come over and pick up the robber and drag him into the play area because we literally had a playground there with a door in it and a couple windows. You ever been there, done that before? And they're having fun. And they're changing over cops and robbers. The cop will shoot another person. I can't do it anymore because I probably wouldn't be able to get out. And they will fall dead on the ground. And the other cop will get mad and chase them around the backyard and pick them up. And they will pull them in. And then they would block off the robber at the door and sit there until he plead for mercy. Ever had neighborhood games like that before? We used to stuff your head in a snowbank in upstate New York if you dropped the football. That's why I'm a Cowboys fan, because they never dropped the football. Could never be a Pittsburgh fan, okay? We, we did all that stuff. That's what you call life. It, they did this all day long. I could build a house and watch them, and it was fun. Until a bee, one bee, flew into jail. You laugh. Moms, you laugh. And this kid lost it. Ah, there's a bee in here. He's going crazy and all this stuff. I could hear the scream, but the two cops could not because they thought it was a game. And the bee's hovering around, and he's screaming, he's yelling. His face is turned red, and he, oh, he shoves the door open, knocks the two guys down, and runs inside and tells Mama. Oh, God, he told Mama. You laugh, Mamas. But you know what she did? She came out and said, oh, I'm sorry, my son was mad at you, right? No, she came out mad. And she cursed me out face to face. This was 20 years ago. America was used to be like this, right? And she gave it to me for five minutes. Have you ever wanted to politely push a woman or I know it's not allowed then 
So what kind of man would, would lock up my son and let a bee bite him? I'm like, I didn't do anything. I'm up there building. If you were a proper mother, you would just watch your own son. Why am I watching your son? I couldn't say it because I wasn't that smart back then, but now I am because I had three kids. Then she said this. What kind of Christian are you? What do you say? She's got me, right? I say nothing. She turns around. Now I have to live next to this pain in the backside. Do you think she said hi to me the next time she saw me? Or do you think she turned around and... And my son's mad at me because he can't play cop and robbers again because the kid's grounded because he can't come over to my house. I locked him in with a B. Ever been there before? You ever been driving down the street and you made a mistake and someone rolled down their window and put their finger out and put the middle one up? Why are we laughing? Hopefully you didn't do this. Have you ever been to a sporting event before? I took my son up to Syracuse. I'm a diehard bleed or Syracuse fan. And you know what happened? He was a Carolina fan. Carolina won. He's the only Carolina guy there. I don't care. But I wanted him to experience the dome. And this woman is standing the whole game. So I politely asked her, ma'am, could you sit down, please, so I could see the court? And the guy behind me says, yes. While her son, he almost beat me up. Is that the America we're living in? We don't have enemies like Rome and Egypt. We have neighbors and people who will cancel us and treat us and mock us and laugh at us and persecute us. What do we do? God, I have to pray for a love at a woman who cursed me out? Why do I have to pray for her? Because you're not a man of hate. Oh, been there? Done that before? See, teens, that's the love of Christ. Your response is a prayer of love. And you take that into your next step of life, you can succeed anywhere in this life. Can they not? Because we've been there, and we've gone through it too. They just changed the term, call it cancel. I can be canceled for saying one negative thing. I'm used to, I had a neighbor that did a lot worse. I have family members who have cursed me out, being from non-believing family. They just yell at you, ever been there? Nothing's new. Do I pray for them? You bet. You know what I pray? That the grace of God would fall upon them so much that God would change them. Why do I do that? Because they're my family one members and I love them. Why can't I do that for a neighbor? Why is this so hard? Until you start living the first beatitude and you recognize real fast, God, I can't do this. Blessed is he who is poor in spirit. God, you're on our side. If I can just come to a point, whatever that relationship is, and pray that you would just pour your spirit out on me because I truly can't love that neighbor, even to this day. But you can through me. And I don't quite understand how all that works, but you've called me to be that person. What would happen to our homes if we learned that love? Teenagers, keep a keypad with you. You're going to need it as a teenager. Because mom and dad's going to get on your case. And you're going, to think they're, you're going to think that they're your enemy. They're not. They love you more than anyone else than you would ever understand. But you might have to remind them every once in a while to put a keypad upon mom and dad when they're coming after you. Because they're not perfect. And say, mom, dad, will you love this enemy, please? Ever been there, parents? And parents, you're going to need one for teenagers. A lot more. You're going to have to give this to a teenager. Here, love starts with this keypad. Learn how to love, not hate me. I am behind you 100%. You're just going to have to figure out to do it my way until you're in my house, right? Please. What do we do if we did that in marriage? I do it all the time. Yes, dear. That's a prayer of mercy. It works. And I do it with a loving heart. It's kind and it works. 
What would happen if the church of America did that everywhere? If there's really 100 million evangelicals, this world could not stand up to us. If we just pray that the power of the Spirit would give us a love that's impossible, a complete love, not knowledge, but a complete love of power for those who are going to mock us, laugh at us, pick on us, and we're going to love. What would happen? Rome would become Christian. America would return back to some of its roots, would it not? The family would be family again. Because that's what true love does. Thanks for joining us for this Sermon of the Week. If you found this sermon helpful, please share it with a friend in person or on social media. Let us know you were here by going to palmyragrace.org slash I was here. You can also sign up for our news and events at palmyragrace.org slash resources. We hope God spoke to you today and that you can share his good news with someone this week.